So hi, everyone. My name is Angela, and I'm the uh, Southwest and California State Advocacy Manager. Um, so we're going to be speaking to you, to you today as we're a presenter, um, and these are just ways that you can present in the future, and then also as mentors to help give you tips on how to present. So after we finish this training session, you'll receive a follow-up email with all the slides, the recordings, and any of the resources that we discuss. And then um, there's also going to be a survey in the email that I'm going to ask for your feedback in. And what I'd really like is if you guys take the survey and fill it out. Um, so this one we are doing on a Friday um, at 12 o'clock Mountain Time. Um, and it's one of our least attended ones, which might be good because then it gives us the opportunity to kind of have more conversations. Um, but I'm always asking in the feedback, like what time works best for you? So please feel free to answer that and give me that information. And if you have um, some constructive criticism, I can take it. I worked in politics for uh, nine years. So I've been yelled at a lot in my life. Um, so next slide. So just a few tips. Um, we ask that you keep yourself muted and your cell phone sil silenced. Um, and there'll be time for Q&A kind of after each section. And again, at the end, we can have discussions. Uh, we're also going to use some polling during this presentation. And then next week, we're going to go into breakout rooms and have conversations about how we would answer specific questions if we were to get asked um, by different community members. Um, and then all... As a reminder, these presentations are just for general information. Um, you'll be able to kind of pick and choose what you want to use when you go out and do the presentations, or if you're not interested in doing presentations and just want to have conversations with community friends. This is just information for you to have um, and just kind of use however you would like. If you do have questions about any personal cases, we're, we're not going to be able to answer those today. But if you email me after the webinar, um, I can connect you with our end of life consultants and they can help provide you with resources and information. Next. Um, so again, just group agreements. Uh, if, when you speak, use I statements, speak from your point of view. Um, life happens, but try to minimize distractions, build upon each other's comments. Try not to just repeat comments. Uh, move up and move back. So allow equal uh, time for your other uh, volunteers to make comments. You can ask questions either by raising your hand. Um, you can take yourself off video and raise your hand. You can use the little emoji to raise your hand. You can write in chat. If for some reason I still don't see you, uh, please, you know, again, feel free when we're in the Q&A section to just take yourself off mute and ask some questions. And then have fun. Next slide. Um, so today we're going to cover compassion and choices and what our mission and vision is. We're going to discuss the medical landscape. Um, we're going to start discussing medical aid and dying. Um, and then in the next couple of sessions, we'll also continue talking about medical aid and dying, messaging around it. Um, the next Friday after that, we'll go over advanced care planning. And then the last Friday of the month, we're going to discuss dementia, what are dementia tools, how they can help you plan ahead and then how to take action, ways to volunteer and get involved with us. Next. So Compassion and Choices is the nation's oldest, largest, and most active nonprofit committed to empowering everyone to chart their end of life journey. We inform, empower, advocate, and defend. We encourage you to decide what you want at the end of life and discuss it with your loved ones. You can get started today and Compassion and Choices can help. Compassion and Choices believes in patient-directed healthcare, where medical providers put their patients' needs and wants first. Next. So just an overview of Compassion and Choices. We offer many services and programs. I'm just going to discuss a few of them that are listed out here. So I already talked a little bit about our end-of-life consultation service. Um, so our end-of-life consultants provide confidential, free, and professional support and information on a full range of end-of-life options and end-of-life planning anywhere in the country. Um, so they can go over medical aid and dying, voluntary stop eating and drinking, advanced healthcare planning, um, how to navigate different healthcare systems. And then we also have our national constituency programs that worked across the nation to build constituents and support. Um, so we have several leadership councils. We have an African-American leadership council, 
a Latino Leadership Council, an LGBTQ plus Leadership Council, we have Doctors for Dignity, and then we have Faith Communities for Choice. Next. So now we're going to talk about the medical landscape at the end of life. Next. So this is just a quote from the book, Being Mortal, and I just really like it, so I add it in here all the time, but life is meaningful because it is a story, and in stories, endings matter. The research shows that people want to end their lives at home with their loved ones, with their pain and discomfort managed, to have their spiritual needs and values respected, and without being a devastating burden for their loved ones. In reality, 60% of Americans die in acute care hospitals and 20% in nursing homes. One in three near the end of life receive non-beneficial treatments, often painful, uncomfortable, and futile, that have no hope of improving health while compromising quality of life. Next. The reality is way too many people with terminal illnesses endure needless medical interventions. Too often, the end-of-life care system is a conveyor belt that people get on filled with intensive treatment, which robs them of the remaining quality of life. Next. So the Stanford University did a research, and they set out to discover whether or not doctors and patients attach the same meaning to the word treatable. So researchers found that doctors or that patients here are treatable is a positive message about their future. They hear that the disease can be cured or at least contained so that it does not seriously diminish their quality of life. If the doctor also shares dire news about overall prognosis, patients often discount this and come away with only hearing the good news about treatment. But this study revealed that doctors mean something quite different when they say treatment. When doctors say that something is treatable, it's because they don't want to say the word incurable. When they use treatable, they simply mean that there is treatment that can be applied. Doctors do not mean to imply that treatment is likely to succeed or that if it does succeed, the disease will go away. They don't even mean that treatment is likely to prolong life. The chance that treatment could prolong life might be very small and doctors will still use the word treatable. So, what the researchers concluded is that when the physician used the word treatable, many lead patients or their loved ones to derive unwar unwarranted good news and false encouragement to pursue treatment, even when physicians have explicitly stated information, contrary to, uh, information to the contrary. So this very unfortunate confusion over the word treatable is avoidable. People would like to make their plans and treatment decisions knowing the realistic benefits, burdens, and full risk of any course of treatment. Next. And so research also shows that there's a lot of health inequities at the end of life. Women of color with ovarian cancer are twice as likely to receive aggressive end of life care compared to white women. Black women with advanced stage breast cancer are less likely to get supportive care medicines like antidepressants and sleep aids than white women. And historically underserved populations are less likely to receive pain medication, less likely to be enrolled in hospice, and more likely to be disenrolled at higher rates. And they're also less likely to receive palliative care and more likely to receive aggressive end of life treatments. Additionally, nearly twice as many white Americans as Black Americans over the age of 65 have their health care advance directives, which are the documents that state their end-of-life preferences. Next. So when confronted with a serious illness, our first instinct is typically self-preservation. We are often willing to take any medical intervention suggested by our doctor and specialist. I am totally guilty of doing this too. When my doctor says something, I usually just take it. Um, and since I've started working here, I've started, I don't know if this is best, but I started Googling um, kind of different treatment options as well. Um, but it is important to know that you don't have to. The key to understanding the pros and cons and the potential benefits and risk and then make an informed decision. So there are three important rights. The first one is informed consent. This would be a situation where medical providers tell you the risk. You need to talk about the benefits of the procedures or the medical intervention. There are procedures at the end of life that you may want or may not want. 
you want to ask what the expected outcomes are. What are the odds that this will go wrong and what might that look like if that happens? We'll be talking more about our decoder tools later on in the series, which will also help with this prep process. And this is basically going to generate, generate a list of questions that you can go through and select which ones you want to ask the doctor. Refusal of treatment and medications is also a powerful right. Sometimes the medical system does not make it clear that you have the right to refuse treatment. The right to refuse treatment also belongs to your healthcare proxy. Next, okay. So to be able to identify your wishes, you need to know what your end of life care options are. This slide lays them out and I'll describe them briefly. And we also have more information on our, on our website. So you can always pursue whatever treatment options are recommended. You can refuse or discontinue treatment. So you do not have to treat your illness. You can request comfort care. For example, if you have cancer, you do not have to go through chemotherapy. Or if you have pneumonia at the end of life, you may choose not to take antibiotics for it. Um, people who do reside in a care facility may need to work closely with staff to ensure that they will honor whatever kind of wishes you choose. Palliative care focuses on pain management and comfort care. Pain and symptom management involves the use of medications and other therapies such as massage, acupuncture, and aromatherapy to bring comfort. The symptoms can be disease related, such as pain, shortness of breath or sleeplessness, or they can be um, side effects from treatment. So such as nausea from chemotherapy. You do not need to have a terminal prognosis to receive palliative care. Palliative care is available in medical and assisted living settings and in the home. Um, so that's a big difference between palliative care and hospice is that you don't need to have a terminal prognosis to receive palliative care. With hospice, this is a service that provides passionate medical care at the end of life. Um, so the patient's primary care physician or other doctor will make a referral to hospice care following the determination that the patient will most likely die within the next six months or less. And the goal is to maintain and, or improve quality of life. This team often involves caregivers, um, doctors, nurses, home health aides, social workers, chaplains, trained volunteers, and others. For those who have an appropriate medical referral to hospice, the cost of hospice is usually covered by Medicare, Medicaid, or other third-party insurance. Hospice can also take place wherever the person resides, most often in the home. Hospice can also provide counseling, family support, end-of-life planning, and then brief um, support for the family afterwards. And then voluntary stopping eating and drinking, and the acronym for this is BSAD. So this is a conscious decision to refuse foods and fluids of any kind, including artificial nutrition and hydration. BSAD can be sought in the home or in the care facility, but it is recommended that this process be medically managed to minimize discomfort and that you don't try to do this alone. It's important to have 24-hour care during this process. And by care, just to state, it doesn't have to be like a healthcare physician providing 24 care. It can just be your family, your loved ones, your close friends. Um, but it is encouraged to have ongoing hospice care or oversight by your physician. The most frequently reported symptoms include thirst and dry mouth with occasional hunger. So even though the U.S. Supreme Court has affirmed the right of a decision-making capable individual to refuse food and fluids, not everyone is understanding or supportive of this choice. So if you reside in a care facility, discuss your wishes with your nursing director or social worker. You'll need their agreement to support you. And you can always, we'll go into talking about BSED a little bit later as well, um, but you can always acknowledge to your caregivers that you understand that they're ethically bound to provide you with um, food or water if you request it, but there's ways to kind of discuss it with them so that they can, you know, gently remind you that, you know, I'm happy to get you, um, you know, something to drink or something to eat, but I want to remind you that, you know, you stated you wanted to do the voluntary stop eating and drinking process. Is this still what you want to do? And then the patient can say yes or no. Palliative sedation, which is sometimes referred to as terminal sedation, is an end-of-life option that is practiced in rare circumstances. This is for people whose symptoms and pain cannot be managed while conscious. Palliative sedation must be medically managed by a healthcare provider. 
This is ordered by the patient's physician and carefully after carefully evaluating the patient's symptoms, disease process and prognosis, and discussion with the patient and the family or caregivers. Sedating medications can be given to the patient in several ways, most often by IV. And typically it's like 97% of people that choose this option um, will die within one week. Are there any questions about what we just covered? Next slide. Um, let me check the chat. I also, you know, so Leslie is sharing her screen and I also was seeing the black boxes. Um, <laughs> so we'll see. But are there any questions that, about what we just covered? Okay, we will move forward, but don't be shy, please. So now we're gonna talk about medical aid and dying. So Compassion and Choice's goal is to make the medical practice of aid and dying an open, accessible option in all states and a standard of care for end-of-life options. Medical aid and dying allows a terminally ill adult to request and receive a prescription for medication that they may choose to take to bring about a peaceful death. To qualify, one must be mentally capable, able to self-ingest the medication, and also have a prognosis of six months or less to live. So the same as hospice there. Next slide. So some of you may be familiar with Brittany Menard. Um, she was a 30 year old woman with terminal brain cancer and she touched the lives of millions of Americans by publicly speaking about her desire to have a gentle passing and to not suffer through her last days. Her family was forced to move to Oregon where medical aid and dying was authorized at the time. In doing so, she inspired millions to speak out in support about the rights of terminally ill and inspired so-called Britney Bills across the nation. And then we're going to try to play this video here, Leslie. The thoughts that go through your mind when you find out you have so little time is everything that you need to say to everyone that you love. So after getting married is when I first started experiencing the headaches and they were quite severe and I didn't understand them because I had never had anything like that before in my life. Right when I was diagnosed my husband and I were actively trying for a family which is heartbreaking for us both. And then I was diagnosed this past New Year's. We went away to the wine country for kind of a New Year's Eve celebration and um, by Jan 1, the following day, I was diagnosed with cancer and told I was terminally ill. I was told I had a grade 2 astrocytoma um, and was told anywhere from 3, maybe 5, up to 10 years to live. I have to tell you, when you're 29 years old, being told you have that kind of timeline still feels like you're being told you're gonna die tomorrow. 70 days post-op, I went in for another MRI and was told I had had a grade change. They were looking and saying it looks like grade four, um, which is the worst and most aggressive form of brain cancer. It's called a glioblastoma. So that was a major shock to my system and the system of my family because it went from having potentially years of time to being told I had like six months. My parents spent a couple months, they just wanted to search for a miracle. In the beginning I hoped for everything. I hope, first I hoped that they had just the wrong uh, x-rays, the wrong set of scans. It was all just a big clerical mishap. Your brain will do really strange things to you when you don't want to believe something. You will come up with fairy tales. I don't wake up every day and look at it. <laughs> um, it's in a safe spot and I know that it's there when I need it. 
I plan to be surrounded by my immediate family, which is my husband and my mother and my stepfather and my best friend, who's also a physician, um, and probably not much more people. Um, and I will die upstairs in my bedroom that I share with my husband, um, with my mother and my husband by my side, and pass peacefully with some music that I like in the background. Between you know suffering or being allowed to decide when enough is enough, um, it just to me makes uh, it provides a lot of relief and and um, comfort that okay that option is there if and when we decide and or she decides that you know, it's time. I can't even tell you the amount of relief that it provides me to know that I don't have to die the way that it's been described to me that my brain tumor would take me on its own. Death with dignity allows um, for people who are in the uh, predicament of facing a lot of suffering that they can decide when enough is enough. Angela, you're on mute. Oh, sorry, I put myself on mute so you didn't hear me during the video. Um, so that so many of you might be familiar with Brittany. Um, and her story helped catalyze a nation. It helped propel the California legislation, which again is where she's from. Um, so after she had moved to Oregon and already passed away, they ended up passing the legislation in California. Um, it also propelled Colorado, D.C., Hawaii, and New Jersey. Next slide. The thoughts that go through your mind when you find out you have so little. So as I mentioned before, a medical aid in dying includes four strict eligibility requirements. A patient must be an adult who's 18 years or older. They must be terminally ill with a prognosis of six months or less to live be mentally capable of making their own healthcare decisions and acting voluntarily, and be able to self-ingest the medication. So if you remember anything from this workshop, I suggest the definition of medical aid in dying and these four requirements. So there are core guidelines in addition to the four key eligibility requirements, and these vary slightly by state. However, the practice standard of care includes two doctors and in some states, a doctor and a healthcare provider who, can, who confirm that the person is terminally ill, has six months or less to live, is mentally capable of making their own healthcare decisions, and is acting voluntarily without any coercion. Physicians are experts in determining their patient's mental capacity. Doctors are specially trained and required on a daily basis to assess whether patients have mental capacity to make informed healthcare decisions, including life and death decisions. And either the primary or consulting physician is concerned about patients' mental capacity, evaluation by a mental health specialist is required before the prescription can be written. Additional guidelines that vary state by state are written in verbal requests, waiting periods, witnesses, and reporting. So the waiting period for Hawaii used to be the longest. It was 20 days and they just got it down. I think, Leslie, is it five days now? We just, Leslie helps with Hawaii. Yeah. 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 That is. Um, so they used to have the longest waiting period. Now, now I think the longest waiting period is 15 days. And then the shortest is two days. Um, unless the physician, in some states they have, it written in that if the physician determines that the person isn't going to last two days, 
um, then they can waive that requirement as well. Next slide. So medical aid in dying has been safely practiced in authorized jurisdictions for decades. Not a single substantiated case of abuse or coercion, nor any criminal or disciplinary charges have ever been filed. Not one. Medical aid in dying is all about patient autonomy and the person having agency over their own body. The patient is in charge. They request the medication, they take the medication, and they can change their mind at any time. Medical aid in dying improves end-of-life care. Studies indicate that availability in authorized states is improving physician training in end-of-life care. Specifically, studies in Oregon and Washington, along with a host of national surveys published by New England Journal of Medicine and other medical journals, link the availability of medical aid in dying as a palliative care option to number number of positive end of life care outcomes, including better physician training and the conversation around dying start sooner. And I'll give you an example. One of the national doctors, Dr. Corey Carroll, um, was sharing about how he had a patient for a very long time, and this patient had cancer and then went into remission, and then the cancer came back, and the patient came in and was like, "All right, doc, like." I'm just going to want the medical aid in dying. And Dr. Corey Carroll was like, well, okay, like, let's hold on just a little bit and talk about what the other options are. And so often when patients come in and say, like, if they've heard of medical aid in dying, the doctors will start kind of going over and explaining what all of the other options available to them are, um, which is what they're also supposed to do as part of the law. Um, so just one option of it, but it's, people hear about it, they start thinking about it. And when they come in and say, like, this is what I want, um, you know, doctors can say, you know, like, we can talk about that when you have a six months or less diagnosis, but we can also talk about these other treatment options that may be available to you. Next. So medical aid in dying helps far more people than just those who choose it. Studies show that just having medical aid and dying as an option relieves fear and anxiety, even for those who never choose the option. And we have a storyteller in California, actually, um, and her dad also had glioblastoma, and he was also very um, nervous about end of life and the side effects that he would get from his cancer. And so he went through the process of getting uh, medical aid and dying, and his daughter is our storyteller, and she'll often speak about from the moment he received the medication, she just saw all the anxiety like leave his body, um, knowing that like if it was to get too bad for him, that he would have this medication. And then he was able to spend the last couple of weeks of his life really enjoying his time, saying goodbye to his family and his loved ones and his friends, spending time doing things that he really enjoyed. Um, and then he ended up actually slipping off into a coma and passing away that way. Medical aid in dying is optional. It's optional for physicians and patients. So no person is required to use it and no doctor is mandated to provide it. It is illegal to force someone to use it. Penalties for coercion and misuse are severe. So the Medscape poll asked physicians about medical aid in dying at two, time, or at two times um, in 2010 and then in 2020. And the question that this poll asked, um, which is not what we say, but they asked specifically, should physician assisted dying, um, if these doctors agreed with it, that it should be legal. So in 2010, 46% said yes. And in 2020, 55% of doctors said that this should be legal. Notably, the proportion of physicians who disagreed with this statement fell from 41% in 2010 to 28% in 2020. So support appears to be growing among doctors and opposition is declining. Next. So since 2015, 23 medical societies have dropped their opposition to medical aid and dying. Whether by supporting the practice or having a neutral position, these organizations believe in allowing physicians and patients to determine for themselves if they would participate. In 2018, the American Academy of Family Physicians broke ranks with the American Medical Association by dropping their opposition and moving to engage neutrality on the issue. 
In addition, American Academy of Family Physicians called on the AMA to join them in updating their language and to begin to refer to medical aid and dying as a medical practice and to reject and retire the term assisted suicide. So striking a balance in the new policy, the AMA highlighted two separate provisions in, of the medical code of ethics as relevant and applicable to medical aid and dying, establishing that physicians who participate in medical aid and dying are adhering to their professional ethical obligations, as are physicians who decline to participate. This position allows for, respects, and supports the diverse views of the AMA's membership. There are more details regarding the 2019 policy of the AMA, and I can share with you guys later a fact sheet about that. And so this is a Gallup poll from May of 2020, and 74% of U.S. residents agree that when a person has a disease that cannot be cured, doctors should be allowed by law to end the patient's life by some painless means if the patient and his or her family request it. This support level represents an increase of two points from 2018 when it was at 72%, and then six points from 2019 when it was at 68%. The support cuts across all demographic groups, political parties, political philosophies, race and ethnicity, and religious groups. Particularly interesting is that 70% of those who identify as Catholic support medical aid and dying, despite opposition from the Catholic Church. So we have seen tremendous mo momentum in the number of states with medical aid and dying authorization. Currently, 10 states in Washington, D.C. Most recently, New Mexico passed their aid and dying legislation in 2021. One in five adults live in a state where medical aid and dying is authorized. Most are due to legislation, but there are some by ballot initiative, referendums, and court cases. Well, one by court case. Um, we are currently working to get Nevada to introduce and pass medical aid and dying legislation. And then if you haven't heard yet, Vermont, um, they just passed an improvement bill and removed their residency requirements. Um, so anybody could go to Vermont um, and spend their time, their time there. You wouldn't want to go to Vermont and take the medication back to the state that you're living in if it's not authorized there. But you could go to Vermont, take medical aid and dying. Um, we also had a lawsuit last year in Oregon, um, and part of the settlement stated that through the state legislature, um, they will need to remove their residency. So Oregon is going to be doing that. It's just they're still going through the process of it as well. And this is a reminder, this is a national movement and there's activity in almost every state. So this map shows activity during the 2021 legislative session. The teal states have authorized medical aid in dying. The dark blue had legislation introduced and the states with the yellow box had organized volunteer activities, some involving legislation and others involving education and advocacy. As you can see, medical aid in dying is not currently authorized in Nevada, but we're working towards passing a bill as we build grassroots support and educate legislators with the help of our supporters. Um, so that bill passed out of the Senate um, in Nevada and is currently in the House. So. so currently, public health departments in nine authorized jurisdictions have issued reports regarding the utilization of medical aid in dying laws. So Oregon, Washington, Vermont, California, Colorado, Hawaii, the District of Columbia, New Jersey, and Maine. So based on the, that data, we know the following, that cumulatively for the past 20 plus years across all jurisdictions, only 4,209 people have taken the prescription to end their suffering. Slightly more than a third of people, 36%, go through the process and obtain the prescription and never take it. However, they report deriving peace of mind from simply knowing that they have this option if their suffering became too great. Less than 1% of people who die in each state where this is authorized use the law each year. The vast majority of terminally ill people who use medical aid in dying, more than 85%, receive hospice services at the time of their death. There is nearly equal utilization of medical aid in dying among men and women. The rate at which people of color access and use prescriptions under medical aid and dying laws 
appears to be consistently lower than white populations. However, differences in data collection and reporting complicates um, comparisons across states. Another one that's not on here is tend to be people who also have a higher uh, education degrees are more likely to use medical aid in dying. Terminal cancer accounts for the vast majority of qualifying diagnosis and neurodegenerative diseases such as ALS or Huntington's disease following as the second leading diagnosis. And then 90% of people who use medical aid in dying are able to die at home. And as we discussed in the very beginning, that's the way that most Americans do want to die. Okay, do we have any questions? Can we talk? Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, I, I wasn't sure you could hear me, but this is Bill Rogers. We Hi, Bill. Earlier this week. Yes. Um, I, I, from what you said, just I just have one comment. Having been through all this process without medical aid and dying in the past year, one of the options they talk about is palliative care. But you know, my experience is it's extremely difficult to get or find palliative care. With Joanne, I tried in Phoenix and I tried in Tucson. I Googled so many palliative care options last August and September uh, after she had the diagnosis and found that they are either retired people that somehow put that on their name and no longer were doing it or I, it, I found it like impossible to find palliative care. I could find hospice and she went on hospice just fine in November. But I think there's a misconception that palliative care is some option that you can just place a phone call and go into palliative care. I don't see that working. So, but I mean, yeah, that's just a comment. It makes no difference one way or the other, but uh, I, I think it sometimes is made to be more important than it is along with the fact that my doctors recently that I've talked to say, we don't really need it. We have hospice. They can keep you comfortable in the last week of your life. And the doctors in Arizona believe that hospice protects you. But I told you my story. And that is that in the last week of life, hospice cannot give enough medication to keep the patient comfortable um, any more than any doctor in the world excuse me, any doctor in Arizona could give her enough medication other than the bare amount to keep her somewhat comfortable, but at home with no IVs and only little droppers of liquid that uh, you put under the tongue, which only worked once because it tastes terrible and she bit the tube. So I couldn't put it on the tongue anymore. You had to try to drip it around her mouth uh, so it didn't fall out. Um, hospice was not, in our case, a, a, a savior in those last few days. They were wonderful for the two months, but not when it came to keeping her comfortable in the last week of life. Just saying. Yeah, thank you so much for the comments. And um, I'm sorry you had such a hard time finding palliative care. Palliative care is actually easier to find if you live in a city. And I, I know what kind of area, I think you were in Sun City when it happened. So I feel like it should have been not as difficult, but it's especially challenging for Americans that live in more rural areas to find palliative care and hospice. Um, and we have, you know, it's interesting too, because Doctors have their own views on what they think of all of these options as well. Um, so there is a um, hospice in Colorado that we had called one time because um, we tried to check and see if hospices and different doctors are supportive of medical aid and dying. That way, when people call us and you know they, they can't find a doctor or hospice, we can try to refer them some places. Um, but they're constantly changing them. So we had been told that a hospice in Colorado was supportive of medical aid and dying. And so one of my coworkers called there and the hospice said, 
yes, we're supportive, but you don't need that if you have hospice care, you know, um, which is something that a lot of people believe is like, you don't need medical aid in dying if you're getting palliative care um, or if you're getting hospice care. When there's a lot of hospices and palliative care that believe that, what we believe is that it all kind of can go together. Um, and we're actually going to be encouraging a lot of the emergency rooms to start implementing palliative care within them because um, there's been great research done when that happens that people are less likely to die, you know, in hospitals if they are, receive palliative care when they go to emergency rooms. So that is true. All of this stuff um, can be difficult to find, um, which again is why, I mean, it, I do think that you, from speaking with you, Bill, I know that you guys tried to plan ahead and that she, you know, thought about what treatment options she wanted and didn't want, but it's really important to, you know, try to plan ahead. We had um, a volunteer up in Santa Cruz who passed away earlier this year, um, but she knew for like years, like what hospice she was going to, um, you know, exactly. She had everything planned out um, and she ended up passing away in her sleep, um, which I think she would have wanted. So it worked out, but yeah, we have a lot of volunteers who really, you know, do a lot of research ahead of time because um, it can be difficult. So do we have other questions or comments? We have a quiet group today. Okay, let's go to the poll. Um, Leslie. So this is anonymous. Um, so don't feel like we're going to judge you if you get anything um, incorrect here. But so how many jurisdictions is medical aid and dying authorized in? Eight, 10, 11, or seven? So we'll go ahead and end it. Um, so it's, this is a little tricky. So it's 11 jurisdictions, but it's, so it's 10 states plus um, Washington, DC. And then For some reason, Leslie's computer acts up whenever she tries to do these polls. So for the next poll that we're gonna do, which is an eligibility criteria for medical aid and dying? That you be over 60 years old, that you list it in your advanced directive, that you be mentally capable to make decisions, or D, that you obtain spousal approval. And that is correct, um, that you be mentally capable to make decisions. We often get questions about, um, you know, can I just add this in my advanced directive? Um, and the answer is no, because you have to be able to make health healthcare decisions at the time that you're requesting medical aid and dying. It's one of the safety guards that's put into place. Do you guys see a black screen over Leslie's thing or is that just mine? You yeah. guys can take yourself off mute. Yeah, I can see it. Okay. Yeah, there's black screens all there are black screens all over. Yep. Sorry about that. Sometimes Leslie um where she is in LA, um, her internet gets wacky. Um, so if you guys can all kind of go around and we just wanted to hear kind of from you why you support medical aid and dying. Nobody's talking except me. <laughs> I know. 
I know well, a couple people on here, so I'll start you, calling. You, <laughs> yeah. you know why I'm supporting it. Joanne passed away on February 6th, and she desperately needed it eight days before she passed away when she said, I've had it, but we couldn't do anything about it. So she had to suffer through the week. So her story came out this week. You people published it, and it just shows that um, – she would have had a wonderful time if it hadn't been for the last eight days. She fought valiantly after hospice took over November 1st and November, December, January. January got pretty bad. If she could have passed away on January 29th or 30th when she was mentally capable, and she was because she literally chose to drink an in and out milkshake on January 30th um, as maybe her last drink. She didn't know. She could have drank that and it would have been such a peaceful passing. So. I'm fighting like heck for uh, for it in Arizona, and that's Bill, why. Is it okay with you when I send out the um, resources at the end? If I send out a link to your story, oh, certainly. Do I have? Uh, I am publishing my. I am promoting my story. Uh, since I talked with you, I've sent it to every relative around the country, and in a couple, including a couple in Texas, that I have a hunch. Well, I finally heard from one, and one of them, I think possibly has a Christian problem with it. And I think he is still very conflicted with not believing that you should have made, but he's seeing what happened to his sister. And I think the poor guy is going to have to rationalize and really reason with his beliefs. And I think that people have to do that. The story, uh, Azilo put a, an abbreviated version on yesterday also, and I'm giving, um, just as I, I did something I hope is, is going to work. I made a little piece of paper that, sh that I'm going to give all everybody I, I run into around here as I walk through because I tell them that her story's on your website. So I have a little piece of paper that tells them simply to go to Compassion Choices Arizona and read her story. And then I gave my phone number to text me or call me if they have questions. And I'm also saying after you read it, if you would be willing in the future to call or write your legislator on this, please just text me back, you would, and I'm putting these people's numbers in a file. So maybe someday I will call and say, you said you'd text on Joanne's part. Let's do that. Anyway, that's why I'm here and that's what I'm trying to do. Thanks, Bill. Send it anywhere you want. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I could go next. Oh, wait, I just saw Marsha. Oh, raise your hand. Uh, yeah, I mean, that the level of comfort that Brittany Minar expressed in at the beginning of the video of that uh, YouTube video and how the minute she had that prescription, she was able to um, have a quality of life that she wanted for the rest of her life. I just, that is so moving to me. And that, that's really why I support medical aid in dying. And Marsha is actually going to, she's been, she's a storyteller with us as well. And she uh, volunteers with us. So she's going to help me present um, on the last week when we kind of go over dementia and voluntary stop eating and drinking. Um, and her mother uh, went through the voluntary stop eating and drinking. And I'm assuming it's okay if I share that as well too, Marsha, when I send out the resources. Yes, she journaled all about it. So thank you. Pamela, was that you that was going yeah. to go next? Yes, go ahead. Yeah. So I, um, candidly, my company just gave me um, some incentive to like, basically some flexible time off at my work to volunteer. And I started doing some research and um, I've lost most of my grandparents, um, but I've, you know, seen a lot of challenges as they've gone through their end of life. And my own parents are starting to have, um, you know, quite a few health issues. And my mom has actually told me that, you know, she wants um, some of these options, but I don't actually think she knows much as a, you know, first generation child of immigrants, my mom as an immigrant, she doesn't know a lot of what her options are. Um, she is a citizen, but you know, at this point, I think she doesn't know how to access a lot of these resources and what they are. So I thought, 
you know, it's a good time for me to learn just for myself. So I can start planning for my husband and I's end of life as well. And maybe in the process, help my parents start thinking through theirs um, to try to make what they want um, happen. So I'm just trying to educate myself pretty, <laughs> you know, no specific situation in my life yet, but I have just heard so many horror stories of people not being able to get what they want and need in the end. And um, I'd love to learn a little bit more about how to educate, not just my family, but anyone around me on what their options are and um, how they can go about getting them. So what state do you live in? I'm in Texas. You're in Texas. Okay. Um, I can also send you, um, we're going to talk about it our third week, but our, um, we have this book. Uh huh. Um, called the My End of Life Decisions book. And it goes through some different treatment options. It walks people through thinking about their values um, and kind of like what they want at the end of life. It also has our dementia stuff in it. So I can mail you if you would like like four copies of this. That would be amazing. Um, my mom's actually in Missouri, but she be, she'll be visiting me in a couple of months. So that'd be great to just sit down with her and do do one with her and maybe do it with my husband and myself first and it, you know, with the ones you send out, I would love that. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Any other comments? Uh, let's see. Am I still, am I still talking? I can the, hear the, you now. The, yes. the Rogers. Yeah. Uh, I did talk with uh, the people that's, where I live in Arizona at Sun City Grand yesterday about doing an education program and they're very excited about it. So do you, would you be, are you part of, would you be part of something if I put it together with a Zillow and you and everything for presenters? Is that the kind of thing you do? I can do that. Yeah. For everyone who's on the call, I live in Phoenix, Arizona. Um, and so it's not hard for me to go to Sun City and help out with something like that. Um, Leslie lives in LA. Um, and we have another person that Nico, who also helps with our California volunteers, um, who's in LA. We do have somebody in um, Houston. I'm not sure where you are, Kamna, um, who does presentations as well. Um, but then a lot of our volunteers, we train our volunteers to go out and do these presentations as well. Um, but I'm happy to help Bill. Okay, thank you. Any other comments? I just want to make sure I was going to go over some upcoming events, but I just want to make sure if anyone wants to talk, um, feel free to ask any questions or make any comments. Okay, uh, Leslie, can you go to the next slide? Um, so in Arizona, we have our Southwest Advocacy Call. So this is actually a call that we do um, with Arizona, Texas, and Utah. Um, and so it's this Tuesday, May 9th at 11 a.m. Um, in Arizona time. Um, we're on our own time zone in Arizona. Um, but in California, we have an advanced care planning, medical aid and dying and end of life options presentation on Monday, May 8th at 2 p.m. in San Diego. So if you guys live in these areas or you're interested in going, um, you can either put it in the chat or you can email me and we'll get you connected. Um, there's an aging conference on May 19th in LA um, that we're going to try to be tabling at. So if you're interested in tabling and meeting some of the other volunteers, let us know. Um, there's a movie that came out called Last Flight Home um, and it's a documentary and she documented, it's a documentary about her father and he used the California Medical Aid and Dying Law. Um, and so she's been going around, it's award winning. Um, she's been going around to different um, states and different communities, doing a screening of it and then doing a Q&A after. So that's in LA on May 10th at 6 p.m. I think it starts at 6.30, it's just the doors open at 6 p.m. Um, there is a community gatherings for advanced healthcare planning event, Monday, May 15th at 11.30 a.m. in San Diego. This is online. It's called All Things Funeral Meetup. Um, one of our action team members in San Diego does meetups like once or twice a month. Um, and people from 
We have people from Texas join. We have people from all over. So you don't have to be in San Diego to attend the meetups. Um, but the next one is May 23rd at 2 p.m. Pacific time. We're having a San Diego action team meeting June 2nd at 10 a.m. The LA Pride is going to be June 9th and 10th. We're tabling and we're looking for volunteers to help with that. Um, we're going to be going to the Sacramento Senior Health Fair on September 23rd from 10 to 4. Um, we have some volunteers for that, but we're looking for more as well. Next slide. In Colorado, um, this weekend in Colorado Springs is the Senior Life Expo that we have volunteers tabling at. Um, we The next Thursday, I think is May 11th. Um, also in Colorado Springs area is Pikes Peak Senior Lifestyle Expo um, that our volunteers are gonna be tabling at. And then um, the Colorado Advocacy Meeting, this is a statewide meeting with all our Colorado volunteers. Um, it's the first Wednesday of every month at 4 p.m. Um, and then the Denver Pride Festival, which is June 24th and June 25th, um, we will be um, tabling at that and we're looking for volunteers. And then next slide. Um, so if anybody on this call is from the Nevada area, so that is the state where we're currently trying to pass legislation um, and it's looking pretty good. But if you're if you live in that state and you want to help, um, you can email Red or Nico. Um, those are their emails or you can reach out to me if you live in those states and I'll get you connected with them. Um, so Texas, again, we have the Southwest Advocacy Call on Tuesday, May 9th at that's 12 p.m. Mountain Standard Time. Um, and then Austin Pride is going to be August 12th, 2023. And so we're looking for volunteers to help table at that event. Um, Utah, we have our Southwest Advocacy Call Tuesday, May 9th at 12 p.m. Mountain Standard Time. And then the last flight home screening is going to be in Salt Lake City on June 17th. Um, they're still working out the final details for the location for that. Um, and then I just put some national webinars on here. So um, there was a New York Times bestselling book called The Spirituality of Grief. Um, so that's going to be May 18th at 3 p.m. Eastern. And then um, Dying with Metastatic Cancer is going to be May 30th at 3 p.m. Eastern. And our doctors um, get online and go through what that looks like. Is there another slide? Oh, and then so our next upcoming sessions are going to be Friday, May 12th. Um, from 12 p.m. to 1 p.m. Mountain Standard Time. So that's going to be on messaging. So again, we're going to go over how to talk about medical aid and dying, um, how to interact with others when you're talking about it, and we'll do the small breakup groups. And then uh, Friday, May 19th from 12 to 1, um, we're going to go over advanced care planning. Um, and then Friday, May 26th from 12 to 1, we're gonna do charting your dementia journey and a call to action. So just how you can get involved if you wanna volunteer with um, Compassion and Choices. And Rosemary, I see you just joined us. So my guess is you probably thought um, 12 Pacific time. I think you're on mute, but it, we did record it. So we'll send it out. Does anyone yeah, have any, oh, yeah. go ahead. No, I just, I thought I was on Mountain Standard Time. Obviously not. Where do you live? Sedona, Arizona. Okay, yeah. So this is, it's Mountain Standard Time. That's what I was just saying. We change because of, um, we don't do the daylight saving stuff. So it's 11 o'clock our time. Um, okay. And Mountain Standard Time, Colorado is 12 p.m. 11 our time. So. Okay. But we did record it, so that will be sent out. So I hope you can join us for the next couple of sessions. Okay, I'll check my schedule. Thank you. Okay, yeah. Any other questions? Comments? All right, thank you all. It was so nice meeting you. We'll thank see you, you next Angela. week. Thank you, Angela. Thank, thank you. See you next week. Bye. 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 Thank you.